Hello, everyone. It's me again, for better or for worse, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation at the Union League of Philadelphia. So, so I hope you're joining us again. And if not, welcome to your first episode of Mondays with Mundy. So uh, these videos uh, and presentations uh, bring to the league membership and others who are watching a little bit about the league's history itself in many ways, shapes, and forms, uh, sometimes seriously, sometimes more humorously. So today we're going to be talking about the league and its involvement in American presidential elections, that is, the league's politics, because we can't live without them. They involve every part of our, our living, breathing moment every day. So let's go back to the beginning to talk about the league and its politics, because after all, there's a presidential election coming up. Here we go. Green shaver, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And as you can see, all right, I need for that to disappear, please. Let me do the slideshow. Okay. All right. So here we have the first slide. As you can see it's called To Be or Not To Be Politics in American Presidential Elections, Part One, because I think this will be a three part series by the time we finish between now and the election itself in November. All right, at the very beginning. December 27th of 1862 is when Union League was organized uh, that night. And this is the home of Dr. John Forsyth Meggs at 1208 Walnut Street, and that is where the meeting took place. And this is Charles Gibbons, because Mr. Gibbons was a founding member of the Union League, as he would become. Uh, Mr. Gibbons was more importantly, though, a founder, actually the founder of the Republican Party in Philadelphia in 1854. He was a lawyer by profession, was also state senator, and philosophically, he was an abolitionist. So you can get some idea of his thinking about what the league might be. Because Mr. Gibbons would write the first official document that would define what the Union League was as a patriotic social society. Right. This gentleman, Daniel Doherty, would at that meeting come to oppose Mr. Gibbons. And why was that? Because when Mr. Gibbons wrote those Articles of Association, he expected that the league would be a Republican club. And that would be that. But to no one's surprise, though, Mr. everybody knew Mr. Doherty. Mr. Doherty was obviously an Irishman, so it was already a little different in that respect, uh, because this was, after all, a like Anglo Saxon Protestant city. It would be a lost club. But more importantly, Doherty was uh, a Democrat. He was the city's most prominent Democrat. And after the Articles of Association were read and they began to discuss the, part, you know, the, the League's political affiliation, Doherty basically just said, no, not for me. He said, I am for the Union. I am not for any Republican president. And with that, a furious debate took place. And this gentleman, John Ennis Clark Hare, Philadelphia's leading jurist in the second half of the 19th century, uh, stood up kind of calm the waters. And he said basically that while he agreed with Mr. Gibbons politically and philosophically, he agreed more so with Doherty because if the league was just to be a Republican political club, it was doomed to failure because this patriotic social society needed Democrats and Republicans alike to make it succeed in order to save the government. And so Hare sided with Doherty and was able to get the other president to agree with him. And so what happened is that this is the first page of the Articles of Association. All right. And you can see that something's been cut out. So what was it? Let's take a look. Okay. I mean, this is the document that was handwritten and read that night on December 27th of 1862. So here we go. The undersigned agreed to associate under the name of the Union League of Philadelphia. It was originally the Union Club of Philadelphia, but Gibbons thought the League was more powerful and more prescient, if you will. And to adopt the following fundamental articles of association to wit. Number one, the condition of membership shall be unqualified loyalty to the government of the United States and unwavering support of the Republican Party. Now, clearly, that's what got Mr. Doherty going. And so how do we solve that problem? If you agree that you're not going to be a Republican club, you simply cut the words out. And that's what you see here. And that's what they did. So, so the league was going to be non-political. Although, let's face it, the majority of the members are going to at least sympathize and affiliate with the Republican Party. And also the fact that 
beginning in 1860, there would be five successive American Republican presidents, it would be hard for the league not to become Republican in some way, shape, or form, even if unofficially. Also keep in mind that at this point, Philadelphia is becoming the country's only major Republican city, right? And that's important as well. So what's going on? So this is the league as it looked uh, in the 1880s and the 1890s. All right. So let's, so as I just mentioned, from, from Abraham Lincoln in 1860, uh, you have James Garfield who was elected, uh, actually, actually when well, you went Lincoln, Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, and then James Garfield, right? The election of 1884, um, Republican candidate is a senator from Maine, actually the Secretary of State named James G. Blaine. And the Democratic candidate was the former governor, um, I'm sorry, mayor of Buffalo and governor of New York named Robert Cleveland, Democrat. All right. Blaine was unpalatable to a lot of Republicans um, because of his perceived financial corruption. And so there was a Republican uh, movement of political reformers called the Muglums, and they would eventually throw their votes to Cleveland, who would win the election in 1884, the first time since 1856 that a Democrat would hold the presidency. Now, keep in mind that over this time, the major issue in the Republican Party, uh, I mean, beginning, actually, uh, starting with Lincoln in 1860, was a protective tariff, because this tariff would be charged against imported manufactured goods that were made in Western Europe, primarily. And the object, of course, was to protect American manufacturers, protect the workers, protect their salaries, and protect the wealth of the country itself. And I cannot overestimate how important this tariff was to the Republican Party. It, it, it just it consumed their every living thought. Um, it's what made the party the party itself. But now you have a Democrat, and the Democrats were anti-tariff by and large. So, uh, and, and, and as you can imagine, Robert Cleveland won the election by 57,000 votes. Not a lot, uh, but he still won the election because he had the, the electoral votes from New York State itself, which would become important in the next three national elections. And Cleveland would propose eventually, actually in his State of the Union address in 1887, that the tariff be reduced to more reasonable levels as a way of, he thought, protecting consumer prices in the country. Um, but that didn't happen either. So it's the election of 1888. And what would happen is that Republicans would get back in office. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of William Henry Harrison, would win the election uh, primarily based on him winning the 36 electoral college votes in New York and with some political help in New York City, if you know what I mean. All right. So Harrison is going to, again, reinforce the importance of this tariff in American politics and in the Republican Party itself. And in 1890, uh, Senator from Ohio, William McKinley, introduces an 1890 Tariff Act that is passed by Congress since Republicans control the Congress. And the tariff was raised to 50%. So it's a pretty serious thing, right? So, all right. So Harrison gets through office in uh, four years. He does not really want to run again uh, in the 1892 election. Uh, he had beaten Grover Cleveland, by the way, uh, in 1888. So Cleveland's going to run for a third time, right? Blaine, the candidate from 1884, was thinking of running in 1892, and Harrison didn't want that to happen. And so he kind of half-heartedly uh, agreed to accept the nomination at the convention in 1892. And regretfully, his heart wasn't really in it, and neither were some other Republican hearts as well, because he would lose the election to Grover Cleveland, who would become the only American president to serve two non-consecutive terms in office. And as you can imagine, you know, again, the Republicans were fearful that Cleveland would lower the tariff. But again, there were still some Republicans who were pro Cleveland. They voted for him in, in you know the first time in 1884. No doubt they voted for him in 1888, and then they voted for him again in 1892. And there were a number of Union Lake members included in that group. All right. And that's not good because after Cleveland won the 1892 election, uh, they were, well, let's just say they had a 
good party and in the league house itself. You know, not the smartest thing to do for these guys, but they did it anyway. And that, of course, got some of the old guard Republicans upset and really mad. And so they began to fight back. So what would happen is that um, at the annual meeting on December the 12th of 1892, in this room, this, is, this was called Assembly Hall, right? In that room, uh, Charles Claghorn, the member, put forth a resolution that basically said that any candidate for membership from here on in must vote Republican, and if they don't vote Republican, then the league has the right to expel them, right? So let's take a look at that resolution. Here it is. I am a Republican. My political sentiment and principles are in harmony with the national policies advanced by the Union League. Now, I can't see that through my own screen, but I voted the Republican ticket at the preceding national election. If I change my political politics, I will at once resign my membership. And in the event of my not doing so, and sufficient proof is induced that I have broken this pledge, the Union League is hereby authorized to expunge my name from the membership roll. That's pretty serious stuff, okay? And that's not to say that a lot of members didn't support Claghorn in this resolution. However, though, the amendment was made to give them time, and this is at the annual meeting, uh, to give them time to see if, number one, this would pass legal scrutiny, because it, after all, if, if it's going to be added to the bylaws, does the league charter allow for the league to determine the politics of its members as a component, as a measure of membership, the qualification for membership itself? And as it would turn out, the answer was no. All right. But nonetheless, so uh, regretfully, Mr. Claghorn didn't post this, this amendment uh, in the necessary 30 days prior to the meeting itself. So it was going to be carried over to 1893, right? Uh, but they all agreed to do it, and that was that. So this gentleman, Louis Wagner, in the meantime, is going to become the biggest proponent of this resolution of Mr. Clydecorns. That is, Wagner, who was a Civil War veteran, uh, he was a, eventually a, a Brigadier General. He was the first and only commander of Camp William Penn, which was the first and largest military training camp for African-American soldiers in American history, Camp William Penn in Cheltenham Township. So Wagner, and by then he's a professional, he was a banker, among other things. So Wagner is, uh, is a just an a Republican through and through. So he wants to see this amendment passed by resolution at the 1893 meeting. And this is what the resolution looked like as it was proposed in 1893. Candidates for membership must be of good character and impute and politically affiliated with the Republican Party and in harmony with its principles as recognized and supported by the Union League. Failure at any time after the admission to membership to maintain these qualifications shall subject the members to suspension as here and after provided for acts or conduct hostile to the league. Okay, all right. So now this was December the 11th of 1893 in Assembly Hall once again. And once again, the debate was very serious, although it was described as being in good humor and vigorous at the same time. I don't know about the good humor part, I'm sure it was vigorous to say the very least. What, so what's the thinking this time? Um, so once again, um, even though they've had a year, it was the, it, a number of lawyers spoke against the amendment because they did not think that it would pass legal muster. That is, the league didn't have the legal right to tell members how to vote. Okay. All right. Uh, specifically, uh, one member, George uh, Mercer who was kind of the, the leading Republican who uh, led the small group of league members who voted for Cleveland in 1892. And, and Mercer, of course, is at the meeting. And, and his point was that he had every legal and moral right to vote the way he wanted, and the league had no right to tell him. But according to the league's charter, it didn't. And according to the lawyers present, it didn't either. So what was the result? Well, they passed a resolution as opposed to an amendment. And this is what it said that it is the sense of this league that it is a distinctly republican organization and that the directors ought not to admit any applicant not affiliated with the republican party 
and in harmony with its principles as recognized and supported by the league. This resolution passed, all right? Um, and it stayed in effect until 1976, right? So this would become, it was never officially part of the bylaws. It was never part of the charter, obviously. Uh, it was never officially accepted at the legal level, if you will, as we've been discussing, but it certainly became the, the, the guiding philosophical light that would um, determine who the league was politically and, of course, philosophically from here on in. So, so there we go. Um, and if any of you know your league history, uh, you know that most people through its history affiliated or think of it as a Republican institution. And we'll go deeper in the weeds in our next program, all right? So, and that'll take us up to the election of 1928 when something really interesting happened, all right? So I hope that all made some sense. Uh, I probably talked too much. I apologize for that. Uh, I have a habit of doing that. This was a little bit of a complicated issue. I hope, I made, hope it made some sense. And that's and, and it brought a new appreciation for how the league's what the league was evolving as a political institution itself. So, so that's that. So thank you for joining us. Really do appreciate it as always. Um, our next program will be on the Battle of New Market Heights, which was September the 28th. I'm sorry, the 29th of 1864. But it's, and it involved the United States Color of Troop regiments that were raised by the League during the Civil War. So it's really good timing to talk about something like that. So I hope you join us for that for that presentation next Monday. And in the meantime, uh, you know, um, we appreciate your we appreciate your patronage on these programs. We thank the Legacy Foundation for for sponsoring them. And um, you know, everybody stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.